okay so so this is uh, this is lecture 1 for uh, ee419 which is digital communications Okay, so there was a room change. I guess all of you know about it. So you're here. And, uh, can you see it from the very last? Can you see what's being written here? It's fine. Okay, so if you if not, there are some seats available up here also. Okay, so that's a choice. And, uh, okay, so let's start. So a couple of things before I begin. There are there's actually one course which is listed as prerequisite for this course, which is 356, right? All of you here have done it. Okay, so I'll need two other prerequisites. Okay, so I think both of those are core for you, so you should be okay. The first one is uh, signals and systems. I don't know the course number, so I don't know. It's called network systems. Okay, so I'm going to say signals and systems, whatever that course number is. And uh, the next one would be the digital signal processing, which is again something you have done. You've done. I think the course is called analog and digital signal processing and depending on who does it you get some version of it which is fine and the next the next thing I would put down is I would say probability and random processes okay so these are the three prerequisites uh, that I will assume okay so I will I will briefly state some results in these uh, areas mainly for notation just to fix notation for us nothing more okay so i will not go into detail and uh, i'm going to assume that you are you are fairly familiar with this right now okay you might have read it when you were when you did your second semester or third semester and you might have forgotten if that is the case my strong suggestion is please go back and revise okay so i will not i will not do that revision for you here and this course will go way over your head if, if these those concepts are not clear in your head okay so so let's say good familiarity with these things okay okay so any questions on the prerequisites something that somebody has not done okay for instance there was a there was a student who came and said he didn't do 356 but he knew probability and random process i asked him two two or three questions about gaussian random variables and he didn't know okay so if if you don't know enough about gaussian random variables you're going to be in big trouble in this class okay so all those things are uh, emphasized a lot so I'm, I'm not going to repeat those things here in terms of revision or anything like that okay so I'm going to assume you know enough about Gaussian random variables as far as probability and random process is concerned pretty much that's the only thing you need there then in DSP Z transforms or Z transforms and all those things should be very clear DTFT should be very clear to you okay signals and systems in general you should know okay so those are the things we'll require <coughs> no questions on prerequisites okay it's fine so that's 419 and there's also there's also a course that's running in parallel with that which is the lab course for dual degree students right how many of you here are dual degree okay so i think this is supposed to be 18 and class strength is supposed to be 52 it's the list i have but not many people are here okay so so that's uh, i think 471 okay so i don't know the name i think it's called advanced communications lab or something so i'm going to run it along with this course and uh, it'll it'll pretty much run in parallel okay so i might i might in, in fact uh, do most of the lectures in this course and then do the corresponding lab there and and students who are not dual degree are also welcome to do the lab most of the lab information will be up on the websites so you might be able to do it it's, it's you don't require any equipment all you need is a pc and a few other things if you have that you can try it you're welcome to try the lab the only thing i won't do is i won't be grading everybody okay so i'll be only grading the dual degree students on the lab and that's the lab that runs along with this okay so the lab will not start at least for the next two weeks okay so it will start only after two weeks for the first two weeks it's only lectures okay so the 419 lectures are part of the lab okay so don't think of that as something else and this is some other course it's part of the lab okay if you don't attend the 419 lectures you just show up for the lab you'll probably fail the lab okay I don't know if you know the story about the, the last time I ran this lab course. Okay, a lot of people must have maybe spoken to you about it. People got very bad grades. Okay, so I, I I insist on individual work, and if you don't do individual work, I divide by the number of students who did the work. Okay, so it's you can get very bad grades in the lab. 
if you do such things okay so that's that's happened last time so one more warning to 12 degree students particularly make sure you you keep up to speed with 419 because if you don't do this the lab will also suffer okay so that's as far as uh, the introductions is concerned we'll have some tas they're not here right now so we'll have some tas for tut tutorial classes and other things and for the lab as well okay so as far as grading is concerned it's pretty much going to be quiz 1 plus quiz 2 plus finals okay so this will be 25 percent 25 percent 50 percent okay so typically i give an option here I'll, I'll come to it later whenever we get there so there might be an option which involves some programming assignment type thing instead of uh, quiz 2 later on okay only for only for selected students okay it's usually not open to everybody only students who i think are have shown enough promise so far in the course i've attended enough lectures to to do this uh, will be allowed to do an option for quiz 2 okay so that's otherwise uh, just typical finals there will be some tutorials and homeworks which i will assign uh, periodically and i will strongly suggest that you do it because most of my quizzes and finals there is a certain fraction which shows up just from the tutorials so if you just do the tutorials it's a good chance you'll do well in the exams as well okay so as far as textbooks are concerned uh, the main textbook i'll use is digital communications by okay I, i'll write down the last name of the three authors the three authors are barry lee and and Mesher Smith. Okay, so I'll just write down Mesher dot dot dot. Okay, so Mesher Smith. It's uh, it's available in cheap edition. So if you go to Tata Book House or any other bookstore that you like, you can buy this book. It costs about I think 300 rupees or so. It's not so expensive. Not not too expensive. I would strongly suggest that you buy it if you at all you're interested in digital communications and you want to do it for a long time in your life. This is a good book to buy. Okay, so keep that in mind. There are a couple of other books. I'll just write down the authors here. Okay, so not the entire book because those those are not the main books for this course. The other two books are the book by Proacus. Okay, and then there's a book by Madho, Upamanya Madho. Okay. Okay, those are the two books that I will use as well for the course, but you don't have to buy it at least for this. Time. Okay, so any questions? Things that I've missed out, anything that's usually said in the first class that you want to hear, fine. Okay, so so that's it. So one more thing is uh, we we meet we meet in a slot. Okay, Can manage to go to the next page. Okay, so this a slot is. Uh, is okay or more or less except for the Monday morning 8 a.m. class okay so I think what are the other times I think it's Monday 8 a.m. then Tuesday 11 a.m. then Wednesday 9 a.m. and then Thursday what 1 p.m. right am I right okay so uh, how many of you are doing labs on Thursday what lab is on Thursday? I haven't been decided. Okay, so I, I guess it's something we can't avoid. Okay, so in case it turns out that none of you are doing any lab on Thursday, we, I'm okay with extending the Thursday hour from 1 to 3 and skipping the Monday morning 8 a.m. class. Okay, if, if that happens, but I don't want you to push for it or anything like that. Okay, so if it happens that way, then we can do that. Otherwise, we'll just we'll just meet at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. Okay. So that's sorry. What time? Two o'clock. Usually it's around three or something. Find out if it's, if it's free, then we can do it. Okay. Otherwise, it's not possible. Okay. And uh, that's the only thing. All right. So of course, attendance and all these things are there. So uh, I'm going to pass out, pass around a book which has your names here so find your name and then I have to write down the date okay so maybe the first guy can write the date on top okay then uh, put a tick mark next to your name okay. 
Okay. So I think that's it. I don't have anything more to say. The quizzes will be at the regular time. Final will be at the regular time. Uh, I'm okay beyond that. All right. So let's begin. And uh, this lecture will mostly be overall high level introduction of the kind of things that we'll see in this course and to give you a feel for how this course is probably ties up a lot of the things that you've been learning so far and takes you towards uh, description of digital communication. Okay. So introduction is pretty much the main topic of this lecture. Okay. So there's no real need to motivate digital communication today. Okay. All of you have pretty much grown up with the, I mean, you, you knew the internet as you grew up. So, okay. So, you know, digital communication is part and parcel of most of your lifestyles today. Okay. So including cell phones and all these things. So there's no need to motivate digital communication. And uh, maybe, maybe what you, what you need motivation for is the need to understand the, the basics of what's going on there. Okay. So there is, there is some, uh, there is some maturity to this field in the sense that today you have a lot of these systems well built, right? So you're able to use internet without knowing anything about digital communication. Okay. So why should you know? Okay. That's the question that you might ask. And uh, the answer to that maybe maybe it's because it's, it's not really clear. Okay. You've already opted for the course, which means you want to learn about it. Okay. So we'll, we'll be dealing with digital communication at a much more fundamental level than internet. Okay. Internet is supposed to be a very high level network where you transmit packets, receive packets, programs can do these things. We'll be going much lower okay, to the to what's called the physical layer pretty much. We'll deal with how to physically send bits from one, one part, one point in a, in a network to another point. Okay, So it's, we'll be dealing with physical layers. So that's a, that's much more mathematical and much more intense than you can imagine than the internet can become. Okay, So the setting roughly in most cases will be the following. Okay, So you have a transmitter okay, which wants to send a sequence of bits. Okay, so how do I think of a sequence of bits? It's just a sequence of bits, right? So one zero zero one one zero like this. Okay, so it's a sequence of bits the transmitter wants to send. And what are the resources it has access to? One can imagine it has access to electronic circuitry, right? It can build some electronic circuitry. And then there's a pair of wires that connects it to a receiver on the other side. I'm going to start with a pair of wires. Okay, so in future maybe we'll think of other other channels, so to speak, other than pair of wires. But pair of wires is a very fundamental, nice thing to start with. So there's a pair of wires that connects transmitter to a receiver. Okay. So you have to imagine that these guys want to build electronic circuits and all that so that they can send these bits using this pair of wires from the transmitter to the receiver. Okay. So there are some goals. What are the goals? What would you like on the receiver? Okay, very simple goal to think of is all the bits should be accurately reproduced, right? So there should be no error. Okay, so you want no errors as your goal. Okay, so all these things are very clear and obvious, but still I would like to emphasize these notions. Okay, so if you go back to the very classic uh, early papers in digital communication, these processes were clearly defined. Okay, so for instance, communication was defined as a process of <coughs> transmitting information in a way so that there's no error and all those things. Okay, so just for completion, I'm defining these things. Okay, so how would you go about doing it? If, if this were the this were an issue, how would you go about doing it? You would imagine that this pair of wires is really really long. Okay, so it's not like one feet. It's one feet, then there's really no point in communication. Okay, so it's very very long, and you want to communicate at a reasonable speed. You don't want to wait for a long long time. Okay, so how would you go about doing it? The first thing that comes to mind is you want to convert the bits into some circuit quantity, right? And then convert, send that circuit quantity in along using the wire to the other side. Okay, the circuit quantities you're familiar with are voltage or current. Okay, so we'll use both. Maybe I will never refer to voltage and circuit as we go along in the future, but roughly think of it that way. Okay, I want to represent everything I have as voltage and current, and then transmit that using the pair of wires to the receive side. Okay, so <coughs> so that's the first task. Okay, so one way of doing it on the transmitter side, a very simple first cut elementary way of doing it without any, without bothering about too, too many things is to say, I'll take bit one, okay, and then represent it as a, say a five volt voltage level, okay, so something like five volts. So this five can change, it can be three volts, 3.3 .3 volts, 2.5 volts, whatever number you want, okay, so five volts. I'll say bit zero is, say zero volts, okay, so maybe, maybe this is not a very good choice, maybe you want plus five and minus five. Okay, why would you want plus five and minus five as opposed to plus five and zero? Any reason why you might want that? Okay, so think about these kind of things as you go along. Maybe maybe I'll emphasize these things later. Okay, so maybe you want this. Suppose you want this, then <coughs> suppose you do this, 
then what happens your sequence of bits becomes a sequence of voltage levels okay so now we have to hold that voltage level at 5 volts for a reasonable amount of time because if you don't hold it for a reasonable amount of time there's no chance that it will ever propagate far away to some distance point on a pair of wires okay so 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 there's a time period involved for each bit okay so I'll, i'm going to say bit 1 is 5 volts for say t seconds okay and then bit 0 is 0 volts for again t seconds okay so once i do it i get actually a voltage waveform corresponding to my bit sequence okay so this process is pretty much the first step that one can visualize in doing a communication of bits from one side to the one from a transmitter to the receiver okay so i'm going to call that as say, say step 1 okay what do i do in step 1 i convert bits to it's too noisy i don't know i i we don't have access to the switches hey but i need this fan i'll die otherwise Okay, so yeah, seeing your fans, you can switch off and uh, I'm okay with that, okay. Okay, so, so converts bi convert bits to, I'll say signal, okay, some signal, okay, so signal, what is the signal? Signal is it's like a voltage waveform or a current waveform, okay, so that's how you think about it. For instance, if I have this bit sequence, 100110, and I use this kind of a conversion, right? bit 1 going to 5 volts and bit 0 going to 0 volts, right? So how will, how will the waveform look? How will the waveform look? It's quite trivial, right? It's going to be some kind of a rectangular waveform. Okay? So I'll start with time 0. So I'll get 2t here, 2t here, 3t here, 4t here, so on. Okay? And this is 5 volts. So I can I can set this as my signal that I want to transmit. Okay, so that's the first step, and this the step seems simple enough, right? But there are a lot of lot of careful questions you have to ask at this point. Okay, so when you build electrical systems, there are so many things you have to worry about a signal. Okay, right? When you when you think of a signal, there are so many so many ways to quantify it and think about it. You have to be very careful, right? What are the things you might want to worry about in a, in a signal? <coughs> what are the things you might worry about? The, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. What happens at the receiver is the question. But even before going to the receiver, at the transmitter itself, when you look at the signal, you should be worried about something. When you build a circuit to support such a signal, what are the things you're worried about? I'm sorry. Switching. Okay. So okay. The first thing you have to be worried about is power levels, right? Current and voltage and all these things are significant. Power is very significant, right? Depending on what power it is, you may or may not be able to build it in a certain type of circuit, right? So you have to worry about power. Okay, so power in a signal is very important. Okay, so that's the first thing you might worry about in the signal. Oftentimes you'll be power limited, as in the total amount of power available to you at the transmitter for transmission towards the receiver might be limited. Okay, it, it may not be like thousands of megawatts, right? So you may not have access to that kind of power. Okay, there'll be some limitations on how much power you can use for communications. The governments might limit, limit it, even otherwise, some other base, basic fundamental physics might limit it. Okay, depending on the depending on the system. Okay, so power will usually be something of a constraint. You will be constrained by it. So what happens typically is when you want to drive signals over a long distance. You have to boost their powers up, right? So you'll use something called a power amplifier at the very end, okay? Which will which will push your signal to a high enough power so that, like he pointed out, it can get to it can get to the receiver at some level, okay? Otherwise, the power at the receiver will be almost zero, and then you can't detect it at all, okay? So to do that, you'll you'll push it up, and these power amplifiers are typically very very expensive, okay? To build a what's called a linear power amplifier over a range of frequencies is very difficult. It's very expensive. So, based on your budget also, you might be limited. So, power in general is a very precious commodity in communications, even at the transmitter side. So, so whenever you build a signal like this, you might worry about power. Okay, that's the first thing. What else will you worry about in a signal? What other attribute of the signal you might you might want to control at the transmitter? Okay. 
Okay. Anything else? The time period of the signal. Okay. So, in effect, what are you trying to say is, I'm sorry. The rate, yeah. So, okay, yeah. So, rate is another point, right? So, that, but that's yeah, that's connected to the signal as well. You might want a rate which is as high as possible. Okay, you don't want to keep transmitting at a very low rate, then your bit, bits will not go through at a fast enough rate. So, what's the rate here in this picture? 1 by t bits per second, right? So, the rate is something that you are worried about. Rate of information transfer, which is in this case 1 by t bits per second. Okay. So, anything else? Okay. So, all these things are captured by one notion of signals. What is that? The bandwidth and the frequency representation. Good. <laughs> Looks like signals and systems has gotten through somewhere. Okay. So, anytime you have a signal like this, you are worried about its frequency content. Okay. What is the frequency content of this signal? What bandwidth does it occupy? What shape does it have in that bandwidth? Why, why should you be worried about such things? Okay, so many systems you build react differently to different signals based on what their frequency content is. Okay, for instance, this power amplifier, right? Typically, when you build a power amplifier, you think the amplifier is a transfer function which looks like, which is a constant over all frequencies. It's very, it's pretty much impossible to build such amplifiers. Okay, it will be only constant over certain frequencies. Okay, so all everything you build depends on your frequency content of this signal. Okay, so clearly you're worried about the uh, what what shall I say? It's not the frequency, the spectrum of the signal. Okay, so so may, maybe you're convinced already, but I'll give you more reasons why for why why you should be worried about the spectrum. Because so n right now it's a pair of wires, and whatever bandwidth you want to use is available to you. Okay, but if you imagine a band of radio frequencies and you're using the RF range for transmission, then you don't necessarily own the spectrum. Who owns the spectrum? Sorry, the government owns the spectrum. Okay, so and what do they do? They lease it out to companies and whoever wants to use it. There are some spectrum which is free and open, but there are lots of regulations for that. And then on top of that, additional spectrum which is leased to companies, and you can't use any spectrum that you want. Okay, any RF transmission should be licensed suitably. Okay, once you're licensed for a certain spectrum, there is a certain mask that people will expect they'll put on top of it and expect you to adhere to that mask as far as spectrum is concerned okay your spectrum should go down to a certain db power at certain frequencies there'll be some dependence like that so your bandwidth of the signal that you're putting out needs to be carefully controlled otherwise it may not even be legal okay you might end up in jail okay so it's a serious problem okay so spectrum is something you have to be very very worried about okay so how do you find spectrum for this signal are you aware of tools? Can you, do you know how to find the spectrum of a signal like this? First of all, what kind of a signal is this? Is it a? Okay, so is it the thing I'm looking for is deterministic versus random? Okay, so is, can you say it's a deterministic signal? No, why? Yeah, because the bits are random, right? If the bits are deterministic, then there's really no no point in communicating them. Right? So even the receiver might know it. Okay. So the bits are random coming into the transmitter and you don't know what they are. And depending on what the bits are, you will get different signals out. Okay. So there's no point in computing one spectrum for one set of bits. Okay. Typically, what do you do? Okay, this is what you might have learnt in 356 when you do probability and random process. How to compute spectrum for yeah, some well, random processes defined in a careful way. So you can define this to be a, a certain kind of random process for which spectrum meaningfully exists. Okay, what is the kind I'm talking about? Okay, okay I think you guys are going to have some serious trouble. Okay, go back and at least read the 356 notes once again. Okay, so you need the random process to be what's called stationary in the in the weak sense. Okay, and in fact, this this will not be this can be shown to be cyclostationary and all these things, and then you then you find spectrum for it. You can define what's called the autocorrelation, which is an average of certain things, and then then you define the spectrum for that. Okay, so it's possible to think of a spectrum for this, and the spectrum will be closely connected to the spectrum of what? What do you think the spectrum will be connected to? Yeah, well, ultimately that will be what shape? sync right why is it a sync it will be the spectrum of the rect of the rect signal 0 to t it will be related to that it will be a scaled version of that it's not 
do not be significantly different from that. This is what you must have seen in 356. If you did not see it, go back and look at this very closely. Okay. So these bits are random, which makes the signal itself random. And to find its spectrum carefully, you need some knowledge of how the spectrum is defined. Okay. What what how do you define this thing? Okay. But it's possible to find it. Hopefully, you have tools for doing that. Okay. So couple of relationships I want to point out. Okay, one relationship between what what are the relationship between these three quantities, power, rate, and spectrum? Okay, power and rate maybe it's not clear right now. Okay, we'll go back and relate it later on. I'll give you a relationship which is very nice. But rate and spectrum, you can quickly see a relationship. Can you see? I'm sorry. Yeah, so it will be kind of linearly kind of related. If you want more rate, what will you have to use? We'll have to use more spectrum, right? So your T is going to come down, which means your sink is going to expand more and more on the on the spectrum side. Okay, so so that at least this relationship is clear based on basic signals and systems, and you have to use a lot of advanced communication theory, as, as so to speak, to derive the other relationship. What's the relationship between power and rate and spectrum and all these things? It's a little bit more complicated, but maybe we'll see it as we go along. Okay, so so as you see, the first step itself, which is probably the simplest step that you can think of, is has a lot of complications. Okay, so it's not very clear how to how to do it in a perfect way. Okay, suppose I say my spectrum has to look in a certain way. Okay, how can I do this conversion from bits to signal? It's not clear. Okay, right now the spectrum is going to be a sink. What if I don't want a sink? Okay, the sink there is a problem, right? Sink dies very slowly, right? It dies as one by frequency. You may not want that. Okay, maybe you want something which dies faster. Okay, but then you have to do something else. Okay, so all these things. All these things we'll see as we go along in the first step. So that's the first step, and this is typically called what? Okay, at least in this course we'll call it modulation. Okay, all right. So that's the that's the first part. Okay. All right. So so the next step, <coughs> next step after you get a signal is so basically it's it's the transmission step. Okay, so you transmit the signal, and basically on the pair of wires to get a received signal, what I call a received signal. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this is where you have to you have to use a lot of. Uh, okay, this is where really. The power of probabilistic modeling and system modeling comes in. Okay, so this is where the, a big leap is made, which kind of gives us a lot of freedom and flexibility in the design process. Okay, so I'll describe it. It will sound very simple to you initially, but later on you'll appreciate how this model beautifully captures the entire system and at the same time gives you a lot of flexibility in design. Okay, so this is actually done on done for most channels, but a very nice way of modeling a pair of wires. Is to say it is an LTI system. What is an LTI system? How do you expand LTI? Linear and time invariant system. Okay. So seems like a simple thing to do, but if you've learned enough about these long pair of wires, you'll know it's not quite LTI. Okay. There's lots of lots of things going on there. There are reflections and to worry about all kinds of crazy stuff. But but we'll say more or less it's it's a pair. It's a LTI system. There's no problem. Okay. So once you have an LTI system, how would you characterize how it behaves? It's enough to specify something called the the impulse response or the frequency response. Okay, so you specify the the impulse response. Okay, so which I'll say maybe it's h of t. Okay, which will in turn give rise to a frequency response. Represent it as h of f. Okay, so suppose I give you a pair of wires. How will you go about finding H of F? I'm sorry. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. But the sharp pulse is almost like a delta, right? So you want to keep putting more and more voltage into it. You don't want to burn up the pair of wires. Okay. So anything else which may or may not burn up the pair of wires? Sinusoid uh, measurement, right? So that's the simplest thing you can do. You can directly measure H of F. You send a sinusoid in. What do you expect on the other side? Yeah, it's going to be scaled by the 
the magnitude of h of f or something okay so you may not worry about the phase it's possible to also find the phase response using some clever measurements but let's not worry about it at least the spectrum at the magnitude is important to us we'll assume linear phase and then kill the phase problem okay so mostly will be so that will be a constant in this course we'll mostly worry only about the magnitude response okay the phase response will be assumed to be linear and even otherwise it's it's okay some once in a while i'll talk about it but usually the magnitude magnitude response will be our main problem and at least in this course okay so so that's fine so i'm going to represent my think of my L pair of wires as a lti system okay so in general most communication channels can be very nicely modeled as lti systems okay so that's 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 a bit of a liberation you know i mean previously if you think of communications in the good old days physics was tied to it very strongly okay if you think of optics then people were worried about photons and all these things if you think of uh, rf then people were worried about electromagnetics laplace equation all these things those things are very difficult okay they're not that easy but once you abstract all that out and say i put a transmit signal what i get out on the other side is the transmit signal convolved with a certain imp impulse response it completely becomes a mathematical description okay and you are liberated from all the physics of the situation so you can develop a theory with a certain mathematical description and it will apply equally well to several systems just depending on how your impulse response works out okay so that's the power of this model okay so you as you see as we go along you'll see this is this, this is a tremendous simplification it enables a lot of lot of smart things to happen around communications okay so that's the first simplification so that's the first thing okay so what's going to happen to your transmit signal as it goes along the pair of wires is it's going to get convolved with an impulse response that represents the pair of wires okay the lta lta system model basically okay so but that's not the only thing that will happen okay if that were the only thing that happens then usually communications is not so serious the serious problem is because of noise okay so any electronics you build okay as long as it operates at a non zero temperature will always produce noise okay there will be some noise that is produced by any electronics that you build okay so the at the receiver what are you going to have you're going to have some electronics to receive the signal okay so that's going to also produce noise okay so so that's the next problem the receiver noise okay okay so how do we so the pair of wires the impulse response we modeled as a convolution we we'll usually model receiver noise as additive okay additive as in you have a transmit signal it's going to get convolved with the impulse response and then the noise is going to add to that okay that's how we model there are systems where noise doesn't add it there are systems where it multiplies and all that those are really crazy systems which people typically don't design too much for so we'll only design pretty much for additive noise at least in this course okay so putting these two together my model is going to look like this okay this is a very powerful equation it's very simple it looks very obvious maybe to most of you but it's very very powerful our model is going to look like this okay so let me box this it's an important enough equation okay this is my transmit signal this is my channel response okay i'll call it channel response channel impulse response this is my additive receiver noise okay all right so this will be our model pretty much for the whole of this course in fact we'll simplify this further at least as in the first few lectures but then later on we'll we'll try to attack this model we'll want to design communication systems pretty much under this model okay and like i said there are a lot of physical systems which will fit into this model people have used this model in pretty much all the communication systems that are out there and it has worked out very well okay so you can believe in this model you don't have to be very afraid of it okay you can feel you can happily use it okay so that's the model okay so let me talk a little bit more about this model just to give you uh, a feel and just let you think more about it first of all the transmit signal we talked about enough okay right it's it's going to be a random signal right and it's going to it's going to be a result of the modulation of the bits okay so that's the transmit signal what about the channel response what will it be okay it can pretty much be anything right so it's, it's difficult to say what the channel response is okay so yeah maybe some assumptions you can make but usually this will be at least in this course taken to be deterministic 
okay so we won't look at a random thing well, later on maybe when you learn about more complicated communication systems particularly wireless systems there'll be a reason why that will have to be random as well okay but for now we will at least in this course take it to be deterministic okay the issue then is who knows h of t okay who needs to know h of t and who knows h of t right you have two parties right you have the transmitter and then you have the receiver who do you think can know h of t receiver okay but receiver can know it only with some cooperation from the transmitter right so maybe then they can send it back and forth and all these things so typically the assumptions vary depending on what the channel is but depending on our convenience we'll say it's known at the transmitter as well as the receiver or maybe at the receiver but definitely at the receiver we'll assume you know h of t okay so those are assumptions that are made typically in systems and today you can measure it right you can send a sinusoid on one side and see what com what comes out on the other side and you can measure it so it's possible to measure it so at least the receiver can definitely know okay and there are systems where people assume that even the transmitter knows h of t and that's also feasible it's not too bad to imagine that you first have a training phase where you exchange all this information and then communicate at a really really fast rate initially you transmit communicate very slowly make sure you pass all this information around and then you do fast okay so those that's kind of known known everywhere what about the additive noise what do you do with additive noise okay so you have to model it somehow right so you have to come up with a model okay so typically it's modeled as a random process okay random process with a with a certain distribution what do you think you'll assume is most natural distribution gaussian random process okay so typically this is assumed as a gaussian random process and we will make this assumption pretty much throughout this course in fact we will make a stronger assumption we'll say it's a white gaussian random process what's white yeah well so i'm going to say n of t1 and n of t2 are uncorrelated or independent okay so can i say both uncorrelated implies independent or not so for the gaussian case yes okay so it implies so i can say it's it's uncorrelated between time okay at, at whatever time interval you choose however close it is it's going to be uncorrelated is that a reasonable assumption one can question it but in most cases it's reasonable because you're going to be working with a much smaller bandwidth than the bandwidth of this noise signal this bandwidth of this noise signal is really really huge it comes from some very basic physics and it's very very huge and you're working with a very short bandwidth and within your bandwidth and the time intervals at which you're sampling this will be independent pretty much you can assume assume that without any without any problem okay so that will be an assumption that we will make okay so i'll, I'll qualify these things as we go along i'll will be more precise but roughly this is how the system looks how does the system look you have a certain bits that you want to transmit you're converting it into a certain transmit signal that signal is going to go through a channel which we model as a convolution and then some noise is going to get added to it and y of t is available at your receiver okay so this is your received signal okay okay so we'll make a lot of assumptions simplifying assumptions about h of t and n of t to make our process to make our at least study easy in the first few lectures and then we'll slowly relax those assumptions and study more and more general cases okay so that's so we'll proceed in this course but uh, uh, but this is the model this is the model that we'll use okay so this model has a name it's called the linear gaussian channel linear additive gaussian channel or linear gaussian channel okay you can see why it's linear and why it's gaussian it's, it's easy enough to see okay so so the problem that we'll be dealing with in this class can be given in this course can be given a very specific definition okay what is my definition i have a sequence of bits say some n bits i have to convert it into a certain x of t so that my receiver can recover those n bits error free from y of t which is x of t converted with h of t plus n of t okay and i have to do that at as fast a rate as possible okay that's my problem okay so what's my problem okay communicate okay so communicate i'll put it within quotes because bits from x okay two two criteria as fast as possible second error free 
okay and the model is this okay the model is this. that's it's a uh, so so like you like you see i mean it's not it's uh, it sounds like a very uh, specific course in the sense that it's got a real target right it's a very simple course in the sense that you have just one problem in the whole course right have <laughs> x y of t equals x of t converted with h of t plus n of t there's nothing more to it right very simple sounding thing but there's lots of theory behind it as, as you read along you'll see one there's that's lots of theory behind this okay so but but the, essentially it's simple we're not doing something we're not doing too many things at least we're doing very few things in this course okay so that's the that's the setup uh, let me talk a little bit about the simplifying assumptions we'll make okay so so what's the ideal h of t that you can have okay so what's the ideal h of t you can have what would you like h of t to be ideally delta right so that's what you would like okay so but the problem with ideal ideal delta is what the spectrum then is infinite okay so then h of f has infinite bandwidth okay so so that's the case sometimes we'll consider okay once in a while we'll say suppose you have infinite bandwidth what would you do i mean i might ask that question somewhere maybe in your quiz right so some some something like that we'll consider but typically it's not the case okay always you never you never have infinite bandwidth okay so so it's usually not possible so that's not a case that's good to consider but there's a nice nicer assumption to start off with which captures all the theory very nicely okay and that's the assumption we'll start off with usually okay so this is the simplifying assumption we'll use which is not as uh, uh, hypothetical as the delta case but it's not as complicated as having an arbitrary h of t which is what which is what we are looking for the simplifying assumption which is really good is the following okay okay so i'm going to say my h of f okay is going to be flat from a minus w hertz to plus w hertz okay this is my h of f well it's i'm showing only the magnitude response okay so whenever i draw h of f and draw a, a one dimensional graph it means obviously i'm showing only the magnitude okay the face might be something which i'm not showing okay and then maybe it dies down like this okay i really don't care okay but within minus w and plus w i'll assume h of f is flat okay and i'll assume the level is a okay some a actually we'll show later on this a is not very relevant to us we'll we'll, we'll kind of get rid of it usually we'll assume a is 1 okay it's, it's it's you'll see later on it's not a significant problem to have a non zero a uh, as a non unity a okay but we'll assume h of f is flat between minus w and plus w and we'll say my x of t will be such that what x of f is zero for outside w so i'm going to restrict my transmit signal to a bandwidth which is within the bandwidth for which my channel response is flat okay that's what i'm doing okay that's my simplifying assumption to start off with okay so there is there is something i'm giving up here what am i giving up here okay you can get a feel for it i'll give up something on rate right i'm going to say my transmit signal is going to be constrained on bandwidth i'm not going to allow it to have more and more bandwidth which means there is a certain maximum rate that i am willing to transmit at okay that's fine okay we'll start with that assumption and then we'll see later on how to relax them okay but once you make this assumption things become very nice what happens once you make this assumption what will happen what will happen to my model h of t drops out right you see why it drops out once i say my x of t is within a bandwidth minus w to plus w and my h of f is flat there when i multiply by h of f i'm not doing anything okay it's just flat okay so it drops out and my model pretty much becomes what y of t equals x of t plus n of t of course this x of t has to satisfy this condition and h of t is actually present in that way okay it is telling you that your bandwidth of x of t has to be only between minus w and w and that's it after that it drops out okay what about the a the a i'm going to pretty much say is 1 okay i'm going to drop it out we'll see later on it doesn't matter okay even if it is not there you can imagine some low noise amplifier amplifying your signal to whatever level you want okay if you want to be something say something very specific okay in fact you don't even need that we'll see later on okay so this is this is a simplifying assumption and and it doesn't 
doesn't sound uh, doesn't don't doesn't sound too bad okay so you're not assuming infinite bandwidth you're just saying bandwidth is within the region where my channel response is flowing okay so that's my that's my assumption okay so this is a model which we will start off with and pretty much maybe at least for the first month of the course we'll work with this model okay maybe once in a while i'll go back to the other model but usually we'll stick to this model for the rest of this course okay so so you should also know what it means this assumption means that i'm giving up on a certain maximum rate okay maybe i can go faster but i'm not doing that i'm saying i'll restrict myself to what's available in in the channel okay all right so once you have this let's move on to the last step what does the receive, receiver do with y of t okay so that's step 3 Okay, when can the receiver go wrong in a very simple way at least for starting off with then we'll make it more rigorous as we go along okay so you can you can think of what can happen right so if your x of t is something like this okay i can't remember what my think i did this okay so something like this say this is your x of t okay so how can your y of t look how can your y of t look Okay, I'm going to draw two different possibilities for y of t. Okay, one will be what's called the low noise case. What is the low noise case? When the power in n of t is very low compared to the power in x of t. Okay, so n of t is a very very low amplitude signal compared to the uh, x of t that you're sending out. Okay, so this will be the low noise case. How will it look typically? Okay, it's going to look something like this, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's random, and then something like this. It's going to look. Okay, right. So that's how your y of t is going to look. Okay, it doesn't sound too bad. Okay, even on seeing on a scope, you might be able to read off a few bits. Okay, who knows? It's not doesn't seem too bad. Okay, but when you have high noise or noise which is comparable to x of t, when I say low and high, it's always relative to x of t. Okay, so if the power of the noise is comparable to the power of x of t. Say for instance, you have same amplitude. Okay, which is called a zero dB signal to noise ratio. Okay, so high in the high noise case. what will happen okay so it's going to be some crazy type signal okay maybe you'll see some high and down but it's clearly it won't have a very nice pattern right so it's powers are roughly the same all kinds of things are going to happen okay there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of things okay so this is how your y of t is going to look and now the question to ask is what should the receiver do okay so one of the simplest things you can do right away without worrying too much is to sample this y of t and make based on the sample make a decision okay to sample what do you need you need two things well one thing okay first thing is the same clock should be available at the receiver okay the same capital t the exact same capital t okay the reason why it should be exactly same as if you go to very small t a so small error can build up very quickly okay so you need very very exact same capital t okay so we'll make that assumption we'll say the same clock is available to the receiver and also they are in sync in sync in the sense kind of the receiver knows when the transmitter started okay so after a delay it will know where the bits are starting okay so both of those we'll assume we'll assume sync synchronous transmission and we'll assume the clock is available okay so those two things we'll assume if you assume those two a nice thing to do is to sample at <coughs> t by 2 3 t by 2 5 t by 2 so on okay to get to get some values right so maybe i'll call this y1 i'll call this y2 i'll call this y3 so on okay how will you decide on the bits yeah greater than 2.5 you say it is bit 1 if it is less than 2.5 you say it is bit 0 right seems like a very natural way of doing things we'll justify this more rigorously later on but for now it seems seems clear enough so you so what you do is you gate it or threshold it at 2.5 right so i'm going to say some such thing so it's 2.5 so you threshold it at 2.5 maybe I, i drew the thresholding wrongly okay so if it's greater than yi is greater than 2.5 the bit bi that was transmitted we'll say is 1 so if it is less than 2.5 we'll say bit bi is i'll say bi cap okay this is my estimate of what was transmitted okay so bit sequences is 1 and 0 okay but like i like i showed you in the high noise case this can cause errors okay so if the noise was really high there can be errors okay okay 
okay in the sense that bi bi cap and bi you have to compare and see if they are the same if they are the same there's no error if they are different there can be an error okay so well, we are out of time today so i'll stop here we'll pick up from here in the next class and we'll carry on with what happens now to quantify errors and how to relate it to the other quantities we saw before okay so the so the so 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 the things to remember what we saw is the the parameters in the problem right the problem that we are dealing with that are important are power at the transmitter rate of transmission bandwidth and errors okay well error rate okay the rate at which you are going to make an error okay if you transmit 1000 bits how many errors will you get the error rate rate at which you are making errors okay it should be a, these four are very important quantities and hopefully i gave you a feeling for what these things are and where they come from and we'll see there is a wonderful and great relationship at least for our model y of t equals x of t plus n of t there's a beautiful relationship between all these four which was found long long back okay so we'll try to we'll we'll try to get there uh, in the next class